So everything is intertwined, but everything is consistent and logical and grounded in what kids already know and understand, even if they're only four or five. It's part of the base knowledge that all kids have, even if they don't speak English, they have it. Now, what that does when we use behaviors to ground rules, we can make the sounds more predictable, even when they're the next most likely sound. Instead of being an exception, black, white rule exception, it's most likely behavior, but if not, it probably feels like doing this. You can't do that with a rule. With a rule, it is supposed to be this. And if it's not, well, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And then you just have to memorize the exceptions. But a behavior is different because we do things for different reasons, but those reasons can still be predictable as long as there's a thinking construct that makes sense, that we can mirror our thinking through or that we can navigate our decision-making with. It's kind of like an emotional rudder. It drives your behavior, doing the right thing, being honest, helping someone that needs help. And the behavior is the same for everybody that has that emotional experience. So that's that's the, 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 the fabric that binds us, the universal framework of, of human understanding and behavior, even five-year-olds. So tying the big book of phonics back to these code-based behaviors was the beginning of the secret stories. And stories are basically involved, and I, it bugs me a little, I know it shouldn't, but it bugs me a little when it is assumed that stories are the special thing. It's not about the story. The stories are just the best capsule to, to connect what they already know with the letter pattern. Stories are just a good delivery system, but the story isn't the focus. If this were stories about aardvarks and anteaters getting together with Farmer Fred and Harry the Hippo, and that's why PH says, but like stories can be more confusing um, than the phonics skill, depending on the story. And for someone like me with ADD, you stay squirrel, I'm over there. So like stories can, you know, take me all over the place. I use stories for the purpose of creating an easily accessible framework for memory reconstruction, specifically with kids who don't know what the memory's for yet. They don't have the readiness to even need the skill yet because they're still learning the individual letters too. So why do I need an owl? Yes, I can understand that it says owl because I already know what I say when I get hurt. Ow! The only thing I don't know is what does that? And that's why this visual is so important, this embedded mnemonic. But stories are the best way to organize random bits of data, because first we have to sort that data into recognizable pieces. Then we want to arrange it in some kind of an order so that it makes sense. Now we have to present them visually. And this is especially important when the other half of what's so important to learn is purely visual and abstract. Not only do we have to have the sound learned, we have to have the pattern learned, and then we have to connect which sound goes with which pattern. We don't have to do any of those things if we connect back to an existing schema, which is what you say when you get hurt, ow! And then we represent it looking exactly like we would expect. So now kids can see this and it prompts or triggers them to make the sound, which is ow! Or if they hear the sound, ow! In a word they're trying to write, like how, they can look up at the wall and identify the culprit that makes it. Now, will they know which one does what in which word? Not at the beginning because they don't have text experience yet, but they're two years ahead just in having access. What will help them know which one does what in which word? By reading. How will they get to read it? Because they can. If they have this, they can actually read. Reading is the best and fastest way to fine tune spelling, especially if they're doing it two years before, because now we have this compounded interest. Now, once I start to see use, sure, I would definitely let them know, hey, you know which one of these is most likely at the end of the word? It's the OW. Not always, but mostly. So you can always fine tune as you go, but first you want to go. It's like riding a bike. You don't want to talk to kids about how to ride the bike till they get on the bike. And then they're they're there. And as they're pedaling, that's the best way to learn how to balance, how to steer, how to stop. But first, you've got to get on the bike and get that bike moving. So we have data in random bits like that big giant phonics book sorted. The book was sorted. It was sorted into phonics skills. But I wanted to sort it as reasons for behaviors that ended in sounds. I wanted to arrange those reasons so they made sense. Like first they were roughhousing, then they stopped because of this. I wanted to put a visual connection there to do the heavy lifting for kids so that they would know which patterns did what. It's easy for them to, to map the sound because it's an automatic response to what they already know. Ow! Or this one, what they already know. Or this one, what they already know. But what's not easy, what's not accessible um, early on independently is which letters do that. And so that's where these embedded mnemonics are critical. They have to be able to see them to use the sound, to find the sound they need to read the word her or 
to identify the letter pattern they need to spell it. And they can go in both directions. And finally, all this comes together in an explanation with a story. And you see that pretty little Lego house at the bottom. So that was the method to the madness. Now, the thing is, though, remember when I said it's a little frustrating for me when someone's like, oh, I get it. It's a cute little silly story. No, these are cute little silly stories, but they're good, better, and best stories. Now, I'm not faulting this program. I'm not even going to name the program. I'm only using it as an example of what I call an irrational mnemonic, meaning there's no rhyme or reason and there's no logic behind it that would allow kids to predict the sounds using what they already know. These would have to be practiced and memorized just like the words that you would apply them to. There's a reason. It's not just that this, this publisher wanted to make things hard. It's because they were stuck. They were stuck because they use stories to teach the individual letter sounds. And therein lies the hole that you find yourself in. If you use stories to teach the individual letter sounds, you have individual letter characters. How are you gonna explain why random and disconnected letter characters come together to do something that causes a sound that's highly logical. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you will when I read this to you, because these are the stories. There are seven stories kids have to know to be able to replicate the same mapping of this sound symbol relationship, which is you see this, you go, er, you hear the er sound, you easily identify the culprit. A four-year-old could do that. A four-year-old could do that. You don't even need to know the letters. And a four-year-old could see this and scooch across the floor pretending to be a car or if you scooch across the floor going, ah, they could point to the ones that are doing that in the picture. That is the beginning of orthographic mapping. But alternatively, there are seven stories that one would have to learn this way. And these are second grade stories, by the way. That's when this is presented. Eddie the Elephant and Red Robot. Now, those are the individual letter characters in the individual stories for the letters, which kids have to do first. And there are 26 of those before they're allowed to start these, which now cause those letters to come together. And that is why we have two, let's see, we have, we have seven total stories. So we have Eddie the Elephant and Red Robot. And when they come together, their story is this. They become Ernest Err. <laughs> Ernest Err steals elephants. And as he runs off, he shouts his last name, Err! Impy Ink plus Red Robot. Irving Err steals ink bottles and proudly reports his catch by saying his last name. Er! Urgent Er steals umbrellas and reports back to his ringleader, Red Robot, with his last name. Er! Now that's super cool. And as a kid in first grade who couldn't read well, I would be captivated by acting out those stories. I would have no earthly idea what in the world they had to do with the R controlled vowel sound. None whatsoever. Even by second grade, I wouldn't understand. Even as my age, I don't understand what those have to do with the R-controlled vowel sound other than that's one rigmarole way to get to the sound, but with absolutely no rational connection, nothing that would give kids a leg up before they've even learned the story to already know what the sound is. And if the goal of, of phonics is to map these sound symbol connections in the brain, to, to forge these sound symbol connections, so when you see these letters, you go, ah! when you see these letters, you go, when you see these letters, you go, ow! If the goal is that automaticity and speed, both for reading and for writing, you got a lot of work to do before this will be automatic. One could even argue, and one actually does, which you'll see a little bit later, and it's actually the, the program itself, that these would be really hard to learn. And for some kids, they won't learn them very easily. And it's actually easier just to memorize the phonics pattern. Now, that's where I find stories to be a little bit of a wild goose chase. And that's why I guess I don't like seeing, I mean, it's silly to say, I don't want to describe secret stories as stories. That sounds ridiculous. But I guess I should have named them better because the story is only the package they live in. And what's important is what lives in the package. And what lives in the package is something kids already know, a behavior they already do. Because the letter behavior mirrors kid behavior so that they can navigate in words they've never seen before the most likely sounds of the letters that are in them. And they can fast track more of the code faster. So they have it all of it, all of it all of it in kindergarten. They don't have to wait. Doesn't mean they're all using it proficiently. It means they've, they've got access to it like a buffet. Nobody's starving waiting for the waitress and only having a bologna sandwich. They may only want a bologna sandwich, but the world is their oyster on the buffet. And we are using the buffet and eating from it every single day in math, in social studies, in science, everywhere and anywhere. There are words we are looking for secrets to try to make sense of those words. The secrets are our glasses. They're not something we do. They're something we use to do what we're doing. 
er, impy er, and umbrella er, and earnest er is something you do. You have to do that. You have to practice that. You have to repeat that. You have to reinforce that. You could forget that. Like you have to do that. There are seven total stories to get each of the individual sounds plus the sounds for each of those art controlled vowels as opposed to one, just one secret story.